From Eyewitness News, this is Newsmakers. Rhode Island Governor Lincoln Chafee said it early and repeatedly in his State of the State address this week. The budget I present to you tonight contains no increase in taxes, fees, or charges of any kind. No new taxes is always a crowd pleaser, but it's a change. His previous budgets examined revenue increases in certain areas of the sales and meals tax. Chafee also wants significant new funding for public schools and colleges, municipal aid, and job training. The showcase, however, is a gradual reduction of the corporate tax rate, a play at trying to lure companies to the job-starved ocean state. His plan to pay for the lower tax rate by choking off tax credits may rub companies like CBS the wrong way. Now Chafee has to convince lawmakers and the public his budget is the cure for what ails Rhode Island. This week on Newsmakers, Rhode Island Governor Lincoln Chafee. Good morning. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. Joining me on the panel, WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi and Eyewitness News analyst Arlene Violet. Good morning, everyone. Morning. Good, morning. Good morning, Governor. Thank you for joining us today. Good morning. Um, let's start with the budget. The last two budgets that you proposed weren't very well received because they had some, some tax increases in there. If your new budget calls for increases in spending but no new taxes, does that indicate that your plan for tax increases the last two times was completely unnecessary? Well, don't forget my past two budgets, particularly the first one, uh, I did try to lower the sales tax but by, broadening. by broadening it and also the corporate tax. So this is consistent. This budget that I have here is consistent. Uh, I've wanted to pay for what we spend and also address some of our tax rates. And but there's a lot of focus on that. Why does Rhode Island rank so low? And uh, as I argued in the state of the state, uh, sometimes you're not comparing apples to apples, but let's look at those numbers with a 7% sales tax or 9% corporate tax, and let's get them down. But there's no denying those other budgets had revenue increases in them. This one does not. So where is the money coming from then? That's uh, the good question. It's coming from a growing economy, which is good, a growing, strengthening economy in Rhode Island, and also good management of our state departments. For the first time, not only are we coming in on time in many, many years, but also first time in many, many years, we're not having a supplemental request, which means the departments that are over budget. For the first time, Gordon Fox said he can remember, his former finance chair and his speaker, uh, that there hasn't been a supplemental increase. That means the departments, all the departments in state government, are coming in on budget or under. So we're managing the state well. Very proud of our directors, and this is really the good news. Strengthening economy, well-run state, all the departments coming in under budget, the first time in memory. Really good news. Engage Rhode Island. No tax increase. It's the, a good budget. The group that uh, supported Gina Raimondo, the group that supported uh, pension change, says you had extra money because of pension reform. Are they wrong? Oh, it's part of it. Definitely, it's part of it. And I campaigned, as, I campaigned as a candidate saying we have to have pension reform and was part of every meeting having pension reform. Now we're realizing the benefits of that pension reform. It's a, it's a part of it. But Engage Rhode Island, they're, I think Rhode Islanders are a little suspect of them right now, all that dark money, and uh, they're the ones that came out early and said do not have a mediation. Now we're in mediation. Are you suspect of them? I'd like to see more transparency. The Enron money coming in, and I'd like to see more transparency. Just who, where is this money coming from? Um, Governor, the corporate tax change, there's no doubt that's dramatic to go from 9 to 7 percent. It's even further than you proposed in 2011 when the Assembly didn't go along with your idea to lower the corporate tax. Um, I am wondering, part of how you pay for it is um, reducing a tax credit, the Jobs Development Act. People at home might not be familiar with it, but it's very valuable to CVS, Caremark, our largest private employer, worth $15 million a year. Did you reach out to CVS at all? Did you, to make sure we're not going to lose them to Tennessee or something because they're losing a tax benefit? Yes, absolutely. And I made that very clear. We have to reach out to CVS and bring them into this discussion. Uh, they're well aware, because of my previous budget, uh, that we want to address this a program of which they're the major beneficiary. Uh, so this year, though, it isn't as bad on them as two years ago. Uh, we're doing part of it with that program of which they're the beneficiary, part of it with an enterprise fund we're using some money from and also from general budget in order to lower that corporate rate. So there's three components to lowering the corporate rate, how I pay for it. 
you decided uh, not to take another bite at extending the sales tax uh, to more things. To what degree uh, have you factored in what Deval Patrick is trying to do in Massachusetts, reducing their sales tax, I, I think, down to 4.5%? Are you worried about that? I just met with uh, Governor Patrick a week or so ago just on another issue, and uh, he did not disclose that this was his plan. <laughs> so, Shame uh, on him. No, no, that's the way it works. If you, you don't want to leak your budget. Game of poker, right? Yeah, <laughs> yes. But I think he's more worried about New Hampshire. He's trying to be competitive with New Hampshire. I think that's Are you what worried he's thinking. about it? Yes, I am. Of course, we have border sales, Seacock, and all those border with Massachusetts. Now Adelboro. that you know this, Governor, are you going to, going to go back and tinker then with your proposals? Well, first we have to analyze exactly uh, what he's proposing and the chance of passage in Massachusetts, and we're doing that now. Let me ask you uh, on the sales tax, going even more extreme, House Republicans in the Assembly, the few and proud that they remain, have suggested getting rid of the sales tax altogether. Did you consider that idea at all? Did you look at it? Well, my first budget, as you know, uh, started in that direction, broadening and lowering, and, but to eliminate it all, no, I think that uh, that's a big step. I, I like to do things methodically. Uh, I've certainly met with Leader Newberry, and that's one of his ideas. The House Minority Leader. House yeah. minor, Minority Leader. So, yeah, well, I'm open to ideas how to make Rhode Island competitive. Uh, I have argued that the sales tax is the least harmful to economic growth in the past. No tax is good but the sales tax is least harmful to economic growth. There are many experts w that would argue that. One of the uh, things that you say is, is most harmful, it, you talk a lot about the property tax rate. Uh, municipal aid to cities and towns before you got here was dramatically slashed. Yes. You've recommended an increase in this budget by $20 million over two years, but some municipal leaders say that just, that just does not come close to making up to the cuts that the cities and towns have faced. So if your never-ending mantra is alleviating the property tax burden on Rhode Island, on Rhode Islanders, have, have you gone far enough in this budget? All three of my budgets, my third budget, have stressed property tax relief because, as I said in the state of the state, when you really compare apples to apples, our sales tax and income tax are about the national average. We're about 25, 26 in the country of 50 states, right in the middle on our sales tax and income tax, once you get all the exemptions factored in but we're low on our property tax and uh, local taxes borne by business. That's inventory tax, property taxes. And so I want to address that. If that's the area we rank low, let's address it. So this is the third time I'm coming back. Of course, the mayors and town managers always want to have more, uh, but I'm there on their so side. So have they done enough to cut uh, on their end to try and alleviate that burden? Well, they're arguing they need relief on different mandates binding arbitration and the like. That's what they argue back. We can do more if we get relieved. And I had a package in last year, municipal aid package, uh, to try and help them on some of these issues that they, they call tools, help them, the tools to help them manage their communities better. Uh, that had limited success last year. We'll see. It's not part of my budget, obviously, but it could be part of further discussions. You put I'm ten, urging them to meet with yeah. legislative leaders. You Senate put President, 10 million Speaker. in uh, for them as a little carrot and stick, the stick being they have to fix their pension. Uh, I would imagine you see that as a step in the right direction, starting at $10 million. If you had your druthers, what would you want to offer to make sure these municipalities fix their pensions? Well, as Tim said uh, in the last uh, discussion, uh, the cities and towns really bore the brunt of the downturn of the economy. Uh, that It was the higher ed got the cuts, and then it was cities and towns just really got hammered over the last number of years before I took office, and it disproportionately affected those that could least afford it. The Narragansett, the Barringtons, the East Greenwich, they don't depend on state aid, so it didn't affect them much, Lincoln. But you get West Warwick, Woonsocket, Providence, Pawtucket, uh, Central Falls, East Providence, they just, they, they couldn't do it. So they weren't putting in their annual required contributions to their pension funds. They had no choice. They had to pay the firefighters, their teachers, uh, and they unfortunately made bad decisions on not funding their pensions in many cases. And so now we're trying to play catch up. So yes, I, I, you heard me like a broken record on this issue, helping the cities and towns, particularly on the pension funds. Tried to include it in pension reform. Uh, so. I'm on this like a dog with a bone. <laughs> you must have been very pleased when uh, your revenue director, Rosemary Globley, got the Google yeah. money to go toward the two yes. pension mm -hmm. funds then. Yes. That was great work by our delegation working with the Justice Department and our advocacy, Rosemary Booth Globley and all of us 
uh, coming together to say, let's use this Google money wisely. And is we it got time to pull those decision. communities into the MERS program to the state? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, there's, I believe the League of Citizen Towns has some resistance to us doing that. They're wary of any kind of state uh, uh, oversight of running their communities. But I think it's the, what we should do. Okay. You're back to historic tax credits, reintroducing that back. Was yes. it a mistake to eliminate that? Well, the downturn, the crash of the economy. I mean, a lot of hard decisions were made. Uh, I won't say at those really difficult times uh, that that was a bad decision. Uh, we certainly, as times we bring recover, to bring it back. Think of the, I call it the contagious effect when you take an old rotting carcass of a mill and get it into productive use. The real estate all around it. Uh, gets more productive also. In some of these poorer communities, Central Falls, West Warwick, it's a great program, getting these mills back to productive use. Before we uh, move off the budget, I, I just have a big picture Historic question. Structures. For, you've always been, you've always said you're a fiscal conservative even as you've moved out of the, your old party. Um, some people say, including Leader Newberry, Rhode Island spends $8 billion a year, New Hampshire spends $5 billion a year. And a big part of the problem is we just have too large of a budget for the level of wealth here and the number of people. I mean, wh what do you think of that idea of the budget, that this is just maybe too big a budget for Rhode Island to bear? Well, you can't compare New Hampshire demographics with Rhode Island. They're just completely different. So you just have to look at what makes up our state, high elderly, uh, and, and look at our demographics. and and compare us to other states of similar demographics, and then it's fair. And we're always looking to uh, run our departments well, every single department, from the health department uh, to the uh, DCYF, to human, human services, to the ACI, some of these expensive departments, we're uh, DEM, DOT. We're looking at every penny. We have good culture with our directors in uh, our state really looking at every nickel, every penny, every dime. It's a good culture of oversight on behalf of the taxpayers. Okay. And this good budget is ramification of that. So, of course, we're, uh, Leader Newberry's right in what we're trying to do, uh, lower our taxes and provide good services. That's what we enjoy doing in the state. That's but what you can't please everyone. Why we run for office. In your budget and in, in the journal, the executive director of the Rhode Island Coalition of the Homeless accused you of, quote, turning a deaf ear and a blind eye to the needs of the most vulnerable R Rhode Islanders. I want to go on here. Uh, he said he had the power to do something to alleviate the homeless crisis to help those Rhode Islanders experiencing homelessness, and instead he chose to do nothing. Respond to that. Well, there's always areas that we can improve on, and homeless Chronic homelessness is an area we're working hard on. And with all the programs we've had, uh, you still have this chronic homelessness, all the issues associated with it. And it's heartbreaking to see people uh, without a home, without a roof over their head. And we're still working on that. All right, we're going to have to take a break. But before we go, I want to ask you uh, one question, a news um, this week that Kurt Schilling is putting his famous bloody sock up for auction. It's estimated to fetch about $100,000. Do you think that Rhode Island has any claim to the money raised by its sale? Well, the reason you're asking this here, it, because of course we made one of the biggest mistakes that's ever, I think, been made in the history of Rhode Island, and that is lending $75 million to a retired baseball player with zero business experience. It's, it's just unfathomable that that could occur. And that's why I'm saying no more of those panic-driven decisions again. And the right way to build this economy is the way we're doing it investing in education, investing in infrastructure, investing in workforce development, investing in cities and towns, that's the way to do it. No fancy Hail Marys, fancy plays, razzle-dazzle, that, that's the wrong way. And, and that's the reason you're asking this question, because right. we made a huge mistake. Sure, and, and the, the sock would be a, a drop in that fiscal bucket uh, of $100 million taxpayers could be on the hook. But do you think we should go for it? I don't think anyone's going to bid $75 million for the bloody sock, no, but that would be good. Most likely not. And, uh, $100 million is really what Are we you going to bid on the sock? No. All right. <laughs> All right um, it, it, but should we go for that money? Do you think we have claims? Oh, absolutely, to it? yes. Okay. Yeah. All right, we're going to. We have our court case, and we're trying to recoup all the money we can. All right, our guest this week on Newsmakers, Governor Lincoln Chafee. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Yeah. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. To my right, I am joined by WPRI.com's Ted Nisi and our news analyst, Arlene Violet. Our guest this week is Governor Lincoln Chafee. Ted. Governor, it's uh, been no secret to the reporters at the State House that 
there have been times where you and Senate President Paiva, we did not see eye to eye over the last two years. But I was at a number of press conferences this week, and you two looked like old pals. You uh, jokingly hugged each other in front of the, mm -hmm. the cameras. How would you describe your working relationship with the Senate President at this point? Well, working relationship are the key words, because I do believe if we're going to get this state improving in every area, we have to work together. I've said that consistently. I compare it to a, a rowing shell where everyone pulls on the oars together and the boat goes forward. If we're not pulling on those oars together, it's just not going forward. And so it takes work. I just believe that you have to keep working at it and be careful not to fall into criticizing each other and acrimony. It does take work. And I, I, I can you, promise the Rhode Island taxpayers, so I'm <laughs> going to continue to work on it with the Speaker and the Senate President, with Labor, with business leaders. I want us pulling on the oars together. Are you pulling on the oars together with Gina Raimondo? Of course. Yes, we worked on uh, pension reform together, and unfortunately she did not uh, want to get into mediation. She came out firmly right. in opposition to mediation. Now the courts have ordered us into it. Mm -hmm. uh, unless she flip-flops, uh, I, then I would be doing that mediation, uh, trying to get a resolution, amicable resolution with the uh, so unions to so get us out of court. Out, straighten us out on this. Has anyone from the Obama administration approached you, spoken to you about taking a position in his administration? I love my job here at Rhode Island, no, and we're working you? through... Uh, I, no, I knew you were going to say you love your job, but has anyone offered you, uh, or said, should we discuss this, let's talk about it, and you turn them down, or what's the status? There's a lot of speculation out there. I can say that I'm raising money for re-election. I love my job. We've worked hard. We've had a lot of tough uh, months and weeks so in no the past two years. So no one approached you, it sounds like, because that's, cause that's what I asked, I'm right? I'm going forward with my job as governor. Okay, but did anyone approach you? That's Let's a yes or no. Let's move on. I've answered. Is it yes or no? I've did answered anyone? the question. I, I didn't my hear you say if anybody approached here. you. You, s you said you'd stay here, but did anyone approach you? Arlene, I've answered the question. I don't think you did, Governor, no. but we'll move on. Let me um, let me go back actually to mediation, because I have a, a question about that. Um, I know you were supportive of mediation. You always like when people sit down and pull the oars together, as you say. But it's, it's a law passed by the Assembly that has major fiscal consequences and, and it says things about the Rhode Island Constitution. How does a mediation work in that situation? I mean, are you going to... In, in a closed meeting, uh, decide, all right, the unions want us to rewrite the law this way, and then the assembly just has to pass it? I mean, what would be a, a good result of mediation? Well, I always thought that you don't necessarily need a mediator. For instance, in Providence, I got some resolution without a mediator. But if the mediator helps, uh, and when I was mayor of Warwick, there was a terrible dispute between the teachers and the school committee, and I was working to get that resolved, and the unions really didn't have a good relationship with me at the time, so Kevin McCarthy, uh, former state rep, came in, and really he was an unofficial mediator, So sometimes, and that's why we got a resolution to that back in the 90s with the Warwick teachers back then. It was because of that mediation by Kevin McCarthy. Uh, but so that it was can a contract. Work, but we don't... Ha this don't is a law. Yeah. Well, it's still a resolution that we would then present to the General Assembly if we got something that was favorable to the taxpayers of Rhode Island and the unions agreed to and the retirees uh, and the General Assembly was favorable to it, then we could get it resolved out of court, which would be really uh, Could you the best see yourself bringing outcome. the Assembly a resolution that, that could raise taxpayer costs significantly? Because if, if you're going to give more back to the, to, the, uh, to the unions and the retirees, someone has to pay for it. Yes, I, we'll work it, make sure it's, as I've always said, it's got to be acceptable to the taxpayers of Rhode Island. I wouldn't get engaged in it if I didn't think that was possible. Uh, this in the long run of lawyer fees and litigation, the potential of losing, you just have to factor that in with what we might have to give up, if anything, uh, to get this resolved. You launched a transparency website uh, for the state this week, and the want to point out the site has a long way to go and your chief digital officer uh, says they're you know providing more information adding more information every single day but overall as I said in an analysis the philosophy is a solid making state government more accessible but what happens if you leave governor right uh, how can you ensure that this is going to be baked into the cake if you will and remain sustainable it it's not completely free. You have a, a chief digital officer uh, and it's a philosophy. It, let me put it this way. It was a campaign promise you had. Um, but what happens when you're not governor anymore? How can you ensure this is going to stick around? I do think that once you start something in state government, it's going to continue. And when Richard Leach came in 
as director of administration, one of the first things he said is how antiquated we are in state government. He came out of a great law firm, and he said we're upgrading technology yearly. Here we're stuck in decades past technology. Let's get on this. And so we have been, and the chief digital officers, a result of his initiative, and now this transparency, getting more uh, so that we don't have to uh, scramble around to answer requests for public information that should be available easily to the public anyway, and it's taking a lot of man hours to now provide it. So it all makes sense, not only upgrading, I think we can save money, have more efficient government, Lower taxes. Save money, well, and to point out, save money. You, your philosophy on this. And by yeah. doing that, so uh, you see fewer public records requests. Exactly. And the information yes. is just yes. online. Yes. But do you really think that just because it's in state government, and state government is very volatile, that just because you put it in there, it's going to stick around? I do. You're not concerned about that? Uh, I suppose someone could come in and just say, no, we're closing, turning out the lights, and it's all going to be dark. and. Uh, but I just don't think that's going to happen. Once you start something with the lights on and the sun shining in, uh, it, there's, there's a precedent that probably will continue. Do you support tolls on the Sakonet Bridge, and if so, what amount? Well, we had to replace that bridge because yes. of lack of maintenance. Yeah. And as I said, in the state of the state, that's never going to happen again. We've had public hearings. We're listening uh, very carefully to what the people are saying, the frequent users uh, and the like, and how we can address that. And so now we have all four bridges under the Turnpike and Bridge Authority. Uh, so a toll is inevitable? Bridge, Newport Bridge. A toll is inevitable Hope. there? Here's a staggering fact. To maintain these four bridges, Jamestown, Newport, Mount Hope, and the new Sakana Bridge, it's $34 million a year, something like $34 million a year. And the reason we didn't, we had to rebuild the Sakana because we weren't putting in that maintenance money. And I just don't want that to happen. I said $34 million a year, especially the suspension bridges the Mount Hope and the Newport. Mm -hmm. Very, very expensive. So we just have to pay for that somehow. So tolls are inevitable, it sounds like you're, you're saying. You won't take an easy answer. <laughs> We've we got to pay that's, for it that's somehow. That's like Arlene on the program, <laughs> actually. <laughs> let, me, um, let me bring up, you mentioned, uh, you said the darkest day perhaps of last year was the Newtown shootings in Connecticut. And you said you want to talk with, begin speaking with legislative leaders about whether there are changes that can be made to Rhode Island's uh, laws, it sounds like around guns and perhaps in other areas, to address what we saw in Newtown. Um, have you had any of those discussions yet, or do you have any sense of where you'd be looking at, at where Rhode Island would make changes? Yes, right away we started to compare Rhode Island gun laws. And I made the false assumption that we were really on the progressive side of gun laws. When I, we really looked at it, we haven't been. We're lagging behind our neighbors on some of our gun safety legislation. And Colonel O'Donnell's been terrific uh, getting out front on this, Colonel of the State Police, and comparing us to our neighboring states uh, on waiting laws and assault clips and the like. And so we're having good discussions now. What, what changes do you want to see specifically in the state? That's a good question. We really want to do our homework, Tim, on this and, uh, and see where we compare our, us, our laws with other states and uh, with the national, I've been on the phones with the other governors, with Vice President Biden. All the governors had a telecall with the Vice President discussing this, whether it's violence and coming out of Hollywood, the big discussion of what's mm -hmm. causing this? Why is this rash of these How about your murders? take as a former U.S. Senator? Assault I mean, guns as a senator. I yeah. was firmly on the uh, gun safety but the, side. The president wants to get Wait. rid of assault rifles and high am, uh, high capacity ammunition clips. You know, your take as a former U.S. Senator, what are the chances that he'll be able to get that through Congress and how strong is the gun lobby down there? When I was in the Senate, there were two big pieces of legislation, the assault gun ban, which I favored, which then expired, and closing the gun show loophole. Mm -hmm. There are no waiting periods if you go to a traveling uh, gun show. You just show up and buy a gun because they keep moving. They say they can't have the paperwork to have uh, the waiting period at a gun show. You can buy them there at the gun show. And so we wanted to ch close that loophole. And it was tough even back then uh, under President Clinton. You know, he kept, this was one of his priorities. And I was on the right side, I believe, on those, both those issues. And now they're coming back, and it's, it's overdue. Do you uh, support President Obama's proposals on gun control? Well, Tim was asking, why is it taking so long? The Second Amendment advocates are saying this is, why can't we ban assault guns? Who needs an assault gun with a heavy magazine clip? Uh, they think this is a, a, an erosion, the start of an erosion of their uh, Second Amendment rights. You just have to say, no, it's not. That you just have to come together on this. And this so is the president's on the right side of the issue? Yeah, absolutely. And what do you absolutely. think his chances are? What hunter needs an assault gun? 
What do you think his chances are? Just uh, I'll tell you, uh, I, my experiences and seeing what the NRA is doing now, they don't want to be at the table part of this discussion, which is just common sense. Uh, it, it's, it's not easy. You have some tough states out there. I remember even New England, the Vermont and Maine senators were, uh, weren't easy to get on gun safety because they have big hunting states and big gun states. Governor, we are, West Virginia, uh, we are out of time. Uh, actually, before we go, many people will be watching this on a Sunday morning. Any predictions on the Patriots-Ravens game? <laughs> Another <laughs> big win for the Patriots. <laughs> My <laughs> classmate, Bill <laughs> Chow Your classmate, Bill yes. Belichick, yes. right? You yes. still yeah. see him, I know, yes. occasionally. Yes. High school? Yes. I mean, politically wise, yes. probably to choose the Patriots. All right, we're out of time. <laughs> the governor has been kind enough to stick around. We're going to have more of this interview. I have some questions for him on higher education in the budget online at WPRI.com. For Ted Nisi and Arlene Violet, I'm Tim White. We'll see you next week on Newsmakers. Welcome to WPRI.com. This is a Newsmakers Web Extra. I'm joined to my right by WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi and Eyewitness News analyst Arlene Violet. Our guest this week is uh, Rhode Island Governor Lincoln Chafee. He was our guest on Newsmakers. If you missed any of that episode, it is online at WPRI.com. Uh, Governor, the, our big topic for the program was your budget. Uh, you have proposed $6 million in new revenue for the state's college and colleges and universities, but they'd be barred from raising tuition, tuition next year if you were to uh, give that money. They requested a $12 million increase, so your plan would most likely mean cuts at URI. How is this being received with higher education leaders? I always think you can do better, more efficient delivery of services. So I've asked them to meet me halfway. I think that's fair. I'll raise the six million if you can find six millions in efficiencies. And they I think say that's what? fair. Let's look at it. Let's see what we can do. So you think there is pork yeah. at the state colleges? Yeah, through attrition, as people retire, you ask those that are still to do more. You don't fill those positions automatically. Uh, that's what I always believe in as mayor, now as governor. You, you just run your departments more and more efficiently. People are usually how you save money. Fewer people uh, doing better, more motivated workforce. And yes, I think we can do it. I, you know, I, you, that's my request. Nationally, Rhode Island is lousy at funding higher education. Is $6 million a slap in the face? Is it really, is it far enough when you consider just how how little we fund higher ed here? Yes, don't forget in the previous administration, I believe the fact is they cut them 38 million in three years. Mm -hmm. Huge, huge cuts. And all that did is raise tuition. And I believe that students will not finish high school if they don't think I can afford to go to RIC or CCRI or URI. Why well, finish? I'll go down to the auto body shop and get a job. I won't even finish high school. So there's a multiplier effect of having low tuitions. I'm going to finish high school, I'm going to go to RIC. And that's what we want. That's what made America great all across the country. People going to the local public institutions of higher education, Missouri and Kansas and Maine and Oregon. And that's what I want to make Rhode Island great, affordable tuitions. And I'm not going to give up on my first budget. I put in money. Uh, now I'm back at it. Can I want you see to in, in keep those tuitions down. That's the key. Every budget that you propose, are you thinking, yes. I want to give more, yes. I want to give more each time? I have a very limited set of priorities, <laughs> education, infrastructure, workforce development, cities little, and towns. Little priorities. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> but I, I haven't stopped. They haven't yeah. changed. What was your and rationale? Higher education and low tuitions is a high, high priority for me. Excuse me, Governor. What was your rationale of merging the two boards? A lot of controversy, but when push came to shove, you thought they should be merged higher, low ed because? Well, they, that came out of the legislature. and. But you're a I, proponent. Why is uh, that bad? No, better? no, no. That came out of the it legislature. Worked? We were, uh, we were doing our jobs and managing the board of governors, the board of regents, the two boards, and that that was their initiative. It, it kind of, I'll be honest, it, there wasn't a lot of consultation with me on that. So you were as surprised as anyone? Yeah, yeah. That, so I the heard talk of it, you. but it happened quickly. And once something's passed, I I do make the most of it. And now we're moving forward. Most of my appointments, the new board came off of the two boards. They have the experience and. Uh, we'll see how it works and we'll work with the legislatures. As we said earlier, it, it's what we have to do, work together. 
Governor, you um, you're, you're, sounding, you're sounding more and more like you're going to be up for re-election next year. You're going to run a campaign. You just yesterday uh, had a press conference talking about unemployment coming down to 10.2 percent. Hopefully we can get out of double digits at some point here in Rhode Island. Um, do you think you'll be running as an independent or do you think you might be running as a Democrat? I haven't, re I haven't really crossed that threshold of what, what political affiliation. I'm really just concentrated on what we're talking about, getting the economy going getting these unemployment numbers down. We're going in a good direction. Here's a good fact. For the first time, the five economic indicators, not only for the month, but for the year, since 1998, since November of 1998, they've been positive. First time since, that's Governor Almond's first term. And so uh, things are going in the right direction, and I want to be part of that and keep working at it. I'm, I'm very proud of our administration, what we've accomplished in tough economic climates, and also a lot of, as I said, cloud of negativity, there's been a lot of negativity out there. And there has been, and it's, it's I think it's... methodically moving forward, and now the metrics are proving that we're, we're doing the right thing. And, and it's clearly building the economy taken the right a way. toll on your approval rating. You were 29% right. in That's our right. poll with Joe Fleming a few yes. months ago. Do you think you can convince enough Rhode Islanders to get enough votes next year that you could get another term? It's all about pocketbook issues. If you can keep <laughs> taxes down and people working, uh, good things will happen. And, uh, I know that from my first day in public office. As you said, the unemployment uh, rate is trending downward, but last check, we're still number two in the country. It's nothing to, to brag about. What's your prediction? What is the unemployment rate going to be in two years? I want it at uh, the national average. That's, that's my goal. And full statistical employment is 5.2% unemployment. That factors yeah. in transitions. 6.7% though is the national average. Yes. You, you, so you don't anticipate we're going from 10.2 Get to the national average and then let's get to years? statistical full employment. That's 5.2%. Would you consider it a failure if you don't reach 6.7%? In two years. I mean, that, that's a lofty goal. In as long years. as the, uh, we're trending in the right direction. That those, um, I mean, I, I set the bar high. I always have and I want to be the best. I'm not going to settle for second or third. I want to be the best. And, uh, Can I ask, Governor, um, that's my goal. you must sit here, and it must be a little frustrating in your office in the State House. You look to Massachusetts. Governor Patrick is cut, wants to cut the sales tax, and he has a, I think, six-something percent unemployment rate. Over in Connecticut, it's eight-something. Mm -hmm. You're in Rhode Island, 10.2, and that's actually a cause for <coughs> celebration here. After two years of watching the state and state government, what do you think has led Rhode Island to get into this hole compared with its neighbors? Well, first of all, the previous governor didn't address the revenue side when the economy crashed. Uh, and Governor Patrick, if you're going to compare us to Massachusetts, he did it both with cuts, which you had to have, and also with raising some revenue. He raised the sales tax uh, five to six and a quarter, I believe, from five percent to six and, uh, and a quarter. That's a big increase. And he took some heat for it. Uh, but the economy rebounded in Massachusetts much faster than Rhode Island. We did it all on cuts, mostly to cities and towns, and to higher education. And so we had Central Falls going to bankruptcy, East Providence, Woonsocket, having state intervention. Uh, and so it's taken us longer. I think we made some bad decisions by not uh, addressing both sides, the revenue and the cuts. Do you think it's primarily a question of the state budget as opposed to deep-seated issues with our education mm. system or things like that? Yes, I'm still proud of my first budget. When I first came into office, uh, I, I really tackled lowering the sales tax, lowering the corporate tax. It was a bold budget, investing in education. And the, 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 the critics never really came in and sat at the table with me and had a discussion. They just kind of knee-jerk uh, came out in opposition. I think that was unfortunate. Are right. there any cities and towns that you're worried about uh, will have fiscal problems in the not-too-distant future? Just to go back to Ted's uh, line of questioning, too, I, yeah. I just bite the bullet, uh, take the bull by the horns. That was the, that first budget. It was painful, but I think it, taking your cod liver oil and getting better was the, the way to do it back then. Anybody, Anybody still else? take cod liver oil? <laughs> I, I don't Is think anyone so. else going to take cod liver oil? Can you see that uh, in the future for any other cities and towns right now in Rhode Island? Uh, not with the path we're on, Arlene, okay. with putting the money. West Warwick is certainly a big... Uh, issue for us right now, no state intervention, uh, but with, we're, we're really working closely with them uh, to the best of our ability. One socket still having trouble meeting payroll, uh, but it's a top priority mm -hmm. to be involved in the decision making, help them with their pension funds, help them with their budgets. Former mayor and councilman, it's dear to my heart. I have one last question for you. Uh, there's a push from labor and progressives to increase the income tax for wealthier Rhode Islanders, uh, those making $250,000 or more. We should point out your budget do, does not explore that. But what if the General Assembly does? Where are you on that? 
I'm very clear on the record as a United States center, senator as being willing to tax the wealthy. I think I've, every vote I've taken was in opposition to the, tax cut, the Bush tax cuts that favored the wealthy. I don't think I ever once voted for any of the Bush tax cuts. So I'm clearly on the record as being willing to tax the wealthy. But on the federal level. On the federal side. But on the state side, if you lose revenue, as a result of taxing the wealthy, they just leave Rhode Island and you have less money, it just doesn't make mathematical sense. It's just a mathematical cold look at numbers. I'd be willing to tax the wealthy, but if they're all going to leave and you have less revenue, it doesn't make any sense, and that's what I would argue. All right. Uh, our guest this week was Rhode Island Governor Lincoln Chafee. We have a complete breakdown of his budget proposal on our website with Ted Nisi and Dan McGowan. That's WPRI.com. And if you're having trouble sleeping, you can also read my analysis of the new state's <laughs> transparency website. And if you missed the uh, full program with Governor Lincoln Chafee, it's under the On Air section on WPRI.com. For Ted Nisi and Arlene Violet, I'm Tim White. We'll see you next week on Newsmakers. Ah. Good job, Governor. Thank yeah. you very much. Thanks. Yeah.